to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of God speak God, may your spirit move among us this day. May your grace spill over each of us with such abundance that we do not know what to do. And yet, when we are touched by that grace, suddenly we do feel your, your call, your nudge, and we desire to be the people that you are calling us to be. Now speak to us in a fresh way through these words. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, I was at the General Assembly of our denomination. I was with a friend of mine, and we were walking through the assembly hall, and she said, oh, oh, there is somebody I want to introduce you to. And we started walking towards this man who was late 50s, early 60s, rather simply dressed, unassuming. He saw her coming and the two embraced and, and then she looked at me and she said, Bruce, I want to introduce to you Rhodes Thompson. He is the single most generous man I have ever met. Wow, I thought to myself, that's an introduction to to, to be called the single most generous man she's ever met? Later, she began to tell me about Rhodes and his wife, Lois. Early in their life together, shortly after they were married, Rhodes a minister, Lois a teacher, they committed to live the rest of their life together at the basic income that they were earning at that point. Every raise they would get they would give away. And for the most part, they have stayed true to that, giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. Amazing people. Well, later at that assembly, I went to a workshop where Rhodes was teaching, and he said something that has always stayed with me. He said, abundance is not about one's possessions, but one's perspective. It's not about one's possessions, but about their perspective. So what do you see? What's your take on things? Half full, half empty? Do you honor what you have or lament what you lack? Now don't get me wrong, I mean, we need to recognize that there are sisters and brothers around the globe, even those close to where we are today, who hunger for the most basic necessities of food and clean water and shelter and basic health care. I'm not talking about those folks. Yes, we need to, of course, be compassionate and concerned. But this morning, I'm talking about, for the most part, those of us that have gathered here. The rest of us, what do we see? Do we see an uncertain future defined by an attitude of scarcity? Or do we see a future of hope defined by abundance? Both attitudes are found in the scripture that John read for us just a, a moment ago. And it's one of those passages that I have throughout my life been drawn to, maybe more than any other passage in Scripture, in part because I love the, the multitude of layers that are found in this passage. And it's as if every time I come to it, God scrapes away and reveals something else that's going on in this passage. I love how Mark depicts the disciples. Jesus is gathering there at the, 
at the seashore, people are gathering and, and he's preaching to them and teaching to them. And as the afternoon moves into evening, I can just picture the disciples glancing over at the little sack of food that they brought with them and looking out at the growing crowd, back down to the little sack of food they had, back to the growing crowd. And so they approach Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, we got this, and this idea. Why don't you go ahead and conclude the preaching now and, and send these folks off? I mean, there's still time to swing by Chili's or Pizza Hut to grab something to eat before the evening gets too late. Don't you think, Jesus? They sound compassionate. They sound concerned. But whose well-being are they really concerned about? The people or their own well-being. Come on, Jesus, you know, the Taco Bell drive throughs open up late, but still, let's, let's get these folks out of here. They're covering their own tails, or in this situation, their own stomachs. They have an attitude of scarcity. There's not going to be enough. What are we going to do? I can't get by. It's not going to happen. How many of us have been there at one point in our lives when we looked at our situation, when we looked at our circumstance and we thought to ourselves, there is just not enough. And it's amazing how that, that opinion, that perspective can become entrenched within us. And then in that moment, everything we look at looks as if it is coming up short, that there isn't going to be enough. Years ago, Ruffles Potato Chip had a commercial that showed two Eskimos in this vast frozen wasteland. They are the only two creatures out there. And one of them has a big bag of Ruffles, and he's just sitting there. The other Eskimo kind of looks at him and, and finally says, could I have just one? And the guy eating the ruffles looks at him and says, if I give you one, I'm going to have to give everybody else one. There's nobody else. And yet that attitude of there won't be enough has him hoarding, has him holding on. At approximately the same time, Doritos ran a commercial with Jay Leno as the spokesperson. And he's talking about how delicious, how crunchy they are. And he concludes by saying, crunch all you want, enjoy, we'll make more. Two different ways of looking at things. And I think the disciples have a Ruffles potato chip approach. There's not going to be enough. We've got to hold on to what we have. And then there is this alternative vision offered by Jay Leno and Jesus. Probably the only time in a sermon where I will equate Jay Leno to Jesus. But they're saying, eat, share, enjoy, we'll make more, no worries, there will be plenty. That's the way Jesus responds to the disciples when they're saying, come on, Jesus, send these folks away. He says, why don't you give these folks something to eat? And you can just imagine the disciples at that point stammering all over them, saying, Jesus, look, look. Fear is a powerful manipulator of perspective, shaping our opinion to what our concerns have construed, what our phobias have fabricated. And yet Jesus, even in that moment, as the disciples are backing away, holding on to their stuff, Jesus is able to take it. I'm sure they gave it up somewhat reluctantly, but he's able to take those few loaves and those few fish. And he turns what is certain scarcity into absolute abundance. And not just for those that had gathered there. And this is the part I think so often people miss. 
For the story goes on to say that Jesus sent out some folks to collect the leftovers, 12 baskets of leftovers. And any time you see a number in Scripture, nine out of ten times, it's trying to tell you something. Twelve. The twelve tribes of Israel, all of them. Twelve, the twelve disciples, that was all the disciples. The number twelve symbolizes everyone. So not only are there more than 5,000 that are fed that day, but there are leftovers, Mark's gospel is whispering to us, for everyone, for everyone. Jesus takes the insufficiency of the disciples, this fear-based sense that there's not going to be enough, and all of a sudden draws out of that an abundance. He demonstrates this plentiful attitude even when there are those that are not quite ready to relinquish. When I was in college, a couple of the older students, they just graduated, were getting married. It was in February and they were going to get married in Oklahoma City. Some of us were planning to drive over for the wedding. Well, a day before the rehearsal, it started to snow. Not a lot of snow, a little bit of ice. But in Oklahoma, probably like Texas, that basically shuts down everything. But being the Nebraska boy, being used to driving in a lot of snow, a couple of us jumped in a car and we made our way over to Oklahoma City for the wedding. And the wedding was going to be at a hotel, the same hotel where they were going to have the reception. And we walked into this glorious room, beautifully decorated, more than 300 seats, and there were probably 20, 25 people there when we got there. And people were already whispering, they had 270 RSVPs, how many do you think will come? And a few more showed up, and a few more showed up. But even when they finally seated the family, there was maybe 70. And all of us are just aching. Oh my gosh, the bride, the groom. Oh, they're going to feel so horrible. Oh. The couple came in. It was a beautiful ceremony. And at the conclusion, the minister said, you know, please, let's step out in the hallway and we'll head down for the reception. Well, they had more than three meals for every person that was there. And we stepped out in the hallway. The couple had headed to a room down the way. We were going to kind of wave them into the reception hall. And as they stepped out, we're still bemoaning. Oh, my gosh. So few people are here. Oh, they have to just be feeling horrible. And as the couple came out, they were smiling. And as they passed by visitors to the hotel, they said, we got plenty, why don't you come? And folks thought they were joking at first, but they were persistent and said, no, really, we have got more food than we know what to do with them. He said, we're not dressed very well. Who cares, they said, come on. And I think 50, 60, maybe 70 people took them up on it and came in and joined the party, joined in the feast. Those of us sitting out in the seats looked at the situation and we said, oh my gosh, it's a horrible moment. We're lacking. There are not enough people. There's not enough. But the couple, the people that probably should have felt that more than anybody, looked at the moment and they saw a moment full of possibilities. They saw a whole different thing from their vantage point, from their perspective. Individuals, churches, are seduced by scarcity. We find ourselves terrified by what we think is limited. And this fear-based viewpoint gets us stuck, gets us paralyzed, incapacitated. But what's amazing is how God can, can, can step in and God's spirit spill out on, on us and give us a whole different perspective on what is happening around us. Even when people are clinging tight to what they have, saying, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, God is able to, in some powerful way, relinquish. And all of a sudden, attitudes change. 
They begin to see something differently. And lives are blessed, are blessed. When I came to Cypress Creek Christian Church and stood down here and took your questions for an evening and then later came back and we met over in the activity center and did a meet and greet all evening, you don't know how many people came up to me and apologized. You know, we don't have as many people as we used to have. You know, the, the money isn't quite what it used to be. You know, we used to have a larger youth program than we do now. Do you hear the attitude? Do you hear that sense of scarcity? Well, let me tell you, folks, when I look out right now, I don't see a community that's lacking anything. I see a group of people that are gifted, that are blessed, that are hope-filled. I see people that are grabbing hold of an abundant attitude because goodness knows our world needs it and it needs to start here though. We need to allow the Spirit of God to move among us and to give us a different perspective, a different attitude. So those moments when we feel cautious, when we want to grab hold onto, onto what we have, whatever it is, whether it's tangible things or love or grace, to allow the Spirit of God to sweep over us and to let go of our arms and to watch a miracle happen. Where people said there wasn't enough, suddenly there is enough. Where people said we'll, we'll fall short, all of a sudden amazing things begin to occur. When I was a young kid, growing up, my mother would buy, and some of you will remember, those eight packs of bottled Coke, 16-ounce bottles, Glass, for those of you who are younger, they were really glass. And on, on Saturday night, mom would pull out three little juice glasses and pop open the top of the Coke, and she would pour out from one bottle, 16 ounce, evenly split between the three glasses. So just over five ounces each. And that's what I was used to on Saturday night was a five ounce glass of Coca-Cola. Well, David Hammond was one of my good friends. And I don't remember this story so much, but the last time I saw his mom, Betty, she was telling me about this. That I came over to spend the night and we were gonna stay up late and watch some horror movie. And, and David said, mom, can we have some Coke? And she came down the stairs and she said, I haven't made some frosted mugs for you. And she pulled out three mugs one for David, one for me, one for his sister Kay. They were huge. And she pulled out four bottles of Coke, popped off the lids and began pouring them into these frosted mugs. When mine was full, she handed it to me and I walked away as if I was holding the mother load of carbonated beverages. It was the holy grail of soda. But behind me, David and his sister Kay started to argue. He got more than I did. No, she's got more than I did. And they started to kind of fight over it. And all of a sudden, one of them got spilled a little bit and it had a little bit less. And that even caused the argument to explode more. And according to David's mom, I turned around with my, my frosted mug. I set it down. I took the one with a little bit less and walked away. Because in my perspective, it wasn't less. It was huge. I had never seen that much Coke at one time. I was blessed and it changed everything. Everybody went, sat down, watched the movie. We need that kind of attitude within our church because the world needs that attitude where there is scarcity, where there is sense that we're not going to have enough. We need to enter in with an attitude of abundance to allow that to break open among the people. Because goodness knows, there is more than enough of everything. Whether it's the tangible things of food and shelter, or the things like love and grace and forgiveness. We need to make sure that the world doesn't see a church that is terrified and hoarding and holding on, but a church that's willing to let go and let God do a miracle. You pray with me.
Lord God, in Jesus Christ, you spread a table of welcome. Not for a few, not simply for the worthy, not for those who had it all figured out, but everyone. You make room at that table, a table of grace. And where others declare there is not enough, your faithful activity makes known an amazing perspective of abundance. God, this day we are a people that are are trying to symbolize that abundance, not only at our communion table, but in the bread and the drink boxes we have brought. The growing number of gifts that will go to support Nam, we pray that your blessing is in them and is able to work through them so that those who are hurting, those who are feeling like they are stuck in a, in a spirit of scarcity, all of a sudden something breaks open. Hope is given. A new vision is offered. God, we pray for those in the life of our congregation who are, who are facing surgery, sisters and brothers who are dealing with illness. So often those kinds of situations can can get a grip on us. And we begin to wonder if tomorrow can bring anything positive. God, we ask you to use us so that we might bring in that new perspective, that Jesus perspective, where there is clearly more than what we can see with our own eyes. A great abundance created in and through you. We offer these words in the name of Jesus. Amen.